<coughs> yeah, so Alex asked me to do this after the discussion at Queen Margaret University um, uh, to the Mad Studies course, and it was part of a public sociology lecture, and I was giving an illustration about how Palestine solidarity can be understood as public sociology. So that's where the context came from. So Alex asked me to do something here, and I thought, well, I don't know, I've never been to a ragged university, what, what should I do? And so I've kind of kept it similar to what, what we talked about there, which, so it'll be quite personal. It'll be a lot talking about my experience of engagement with Palestinian solidarity. And because I'm an environmentalist, I, I used to work for Friends of the Earth, I've been active with Friends of the Earth for a long time. Um, it will be seen through an environmental lens, if you like, but it won't just be about the environment. Um, I can see, and I, I put my, my label as Scottish Palestine Solidarity Campaign. We'll kind of come to that because I, I, I became involved in SPSC and I'm now chair. But that was kind of later on. Most of the, what I'll be talking about was before I got involved. Um, so what I'm going to do is talk about the history of the colonization of Palestine. I think from this audience you'll be very familiar with, with that story. I'll we'll go through that very quickly, but, but it, interrupt my own personal involvement, in particular then I'm going to talk about the role of the Jewish National Fund, uh, which I think is, is, is very important. Say something about popular resistance in Palestine and a little bit about international solidarity. My understanding is that this ragged university is very informal, so please interrupt and um, disagree or whatever. Um, I'm certainly not the expert, as I said, I'm sharing my experience and something I feel passionate about. Um, but I know that you all do as well. So, um, let's go back to the Ottoman Empire, the 19th century. Um, uh, if we want to understand Palestine, um, we, need to, we need to look at it historically. Palestine was part of the Ottoman Empire, which was pretty large in its, in its uh, heyday, and it, um, uh, a lot of kind of fairly self-governing components within it. Um, then, of course, the British get involved with a whole series of, of uh, um, things. So, the 1915, middle of the First World War, um, the McMahon Hussein correspondence, McMahon, um, uh, the British, uh, from the British, uh, promised Hussein that if the, if the Arabic forces supported the British in the, in the war effort, then the, um, the Arabic lands would, would get independence from Ottoman, from the Ottoman Empire. The Ottoman Empire was obviously on the other side of the First World War. So Britain promised, Palace, promised the whole area to, um, to the Arabs. Uh, in 1916, the sykes pico, -Pico Agreement, uh, Britain and France, independently from the McMahon Agreement, promised half of the Arabic lands to Britain and the other half to France. Um, and then in 1917, Arthur Balfour promised the Palestine to the, the Zionist movement. So within the space of three years, Britain had promised the lands that it didn't uh, own to three different groups of people. Um, you will be familiar with the, the Balfour Declaration, which, pro which committed Britain to supporting the Zionist uh, aspirations uh, for a, um, a Jewish national home in Palestine. Um, and then, of course, 1920 to 1948, the British Mandate, which um, embedded the Balfour Declaration, made the, Brit the British Mandate, because a mandate was, under the League of Nations, an, a, a legal instrument for a colonial power, it was, it was colonialism, but in a different name, for a colonial power to pass the uh, power over to the indigenous population. And that was the case in every other mandate except for Palestine, where it was used to pass power to the Zionist colonizers. Uh, can you tell me what the League of Nations is? Yep, the League of Nations, precursor to the United Nations, really. It was, it was an attempt for the... Um, uh, uh, for, for, for nations to come together to form some kind of international governance. Um, and like the United Nations, powerful countries have more power in it than, than uh, the less powerful ones.
ones, but it, it was a, a, a form of, of legal um, uh, governance, if you like. So it, 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 it approved mandates for colonial countries to colonize, to either colonize or retain their colonization with a view to uh, ensuring self-determination of the indigenous population, with the exception of Palestine, where the it wasn't the indigenous population that they were preparing self, uh, um, self-determination for, it was the Zionist colonizers. Okay. Um, other people will know more about it than me, so chip in as well. I think it was it came out of the First World War. Was the, was the I, I, and then it and then it turned into the United Nations. It was a colonizers' charter, yeah. But even within its own terms, the I, it was introducing ideas such as self determination. So the idea is that the colonizer, you know, the, the white man's burden, the colonizer should teach the natives how to run a democracy, how to run a, a, you know a, an economy, all the rest of it. But then pass pass the, the the expertise on to the indigenous population. That was the idea behind it. General Attenby was 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 along with the Arab troops that they brought off through the McMahon Hussein uh, agreement were, were progressing towards towards Palestine, and and, and so um, it, it wasn't long after that that. Um, Jerusalem fell to the British. So they, they could see the writing on the wall, the Zionists could, and, and, and also, you know, at that time, Britain was the biggest colonizer. Anyway, you know, if you wanted to get into bed with the most powerful nation, then the British were the ones to do it. Of course, later, the British let them down, so they got into bed with the Americans. But that was, that's, um, that's really kind of, that's the backdrop, if you like. And so the geography, that's uh, Mandate Palestine, um, which in 1948, uh, the Zionists uh, fought to try and take over the whole of of, um, Palestine, uh, fighting against the Jordanian and and Egyptian armies, um, which led to the uh, 1948 to 49 Green Line, uh, and the creation of the West Bank and, um, and the Gaza Strip, which in 1967 Israel occupied, uh, occupied Palestinian territory. Um, and then, of course, in the 1990s, uh, the Oslo Accords turned the military occupation into this complexity of uh, areas under different degrees of jurisdiction uh, with the Palestinians, Palestinian Authority having ostensible control over a small amount of the West Bank and the Gaza Strip, and the West Bank that could only govern with approval of the Israeli army and uh, of the Israeli state. Um, and um, the Gaza Strip, of course, is, is under a, a blockade since 2007. So that's the, that's the kind of backdrop when you're talking about Palestine, we're talking about the environment in Palestine. We're talking about all of that land, but most of it is governed by the state of Israel directly, and all the rest is governed indirectly or blockaded by the state of Israel. My own involvement, whoops, where are we? Yeah, just a bit. we started talking about education, and um, uh, I've been an educator for a, for a long time. Um, community education, uh, educational work within the environmental movement, and then in higher education. So I was very interested in education, and so I went to the World Education Forum in Palestine. World Education Forum is part of the various um, things that emerged out of the World Social Forum. Um, You've heard of the World Education Forum in Davos, where the capitalists of the world meet every year, and the World Social Forum started in Brazil, um, for the social movements throughout the world to talk about how do we how do we strategize how do we learn from one another how do we how do we build connections with one another and they created various other social forums uh, including an education forum which which meets from time to time happened to meet in Palestine in 2010 so I, I said right I'm going to go along to that it's fascinating to hear about the range of different education that was going on in Palestine. Um, it was fascinating to see how they managed to organize 
a, a forum in which the Palestinian people are not able to travel. So there was there was there was you know like lots of stuff going on in the West Bank, stuff going on within the state of Israel, within the, the area occupied in 48, links to Gaza, links to the refugee camps in Lebanon and, and in Jordan and so on. So it was, it was quite a, a complex thing to, to organize. But it, and it was also fascinating to, to hear about education, ranging from ensuring that Palestinian culture is retained within schools and children learn, learn their own songs and their own, their own culture, through to uh, popular education that the Franz Fanon Institute was was was, um, was working with about decolonizing education, decolonizing the mind, through to, as I was saying earlier, about the, 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 the Palestinian version of the barbed wire university within the Israeli prisons. There's a lot of Palestinian uh, activists in Israeli prisons using education as a, as a means of of um, ensuring that the resistance was, was maintained, ranging from uh, you know the, the different factions doing their own political education, so the, the, the Fatah and, the, and Hamas and, and, and the uh, popular struggle for the population for the liberation of Palestine, they did their own political education, but then they all mixed together to learn Hebrew or to learn English or to learn car maintenance or or to learn biology or all the other things that they that they wanted to, to learn. So that that was fascinating in itself. But uh, having um, having gone there in 2010, I spoke to some of the, some of the people from the Scottish Palestine Solidarity Campaign. Wanted to learn a bit more about Palestine, and they said, "Oh, we're organising a, a study tour uh, later the same year um, in um, uh, within well, primarily within the state of Israel." Um, uh, and because that's where the JNF was, was operating. So JNF study tour, particularly they asked me to go along because I they knew I was an environmentalist. The Jewish National Fund claims to be an environmental organization. If you go to the JNF Israel's website, it says the JNF is the oldest green organization in the, in the world. Absolutely bold. I mean, it, uh, I mean, we'll go into it whether or not it's a green organization. Even if it were a green organization, it wouldn't be the oldest in the world. It was set up in 1901, which was after the Royal Society of Protection of Birds, uh, after the Sierra Club, after a lot of other... So it, it's basically selling a pack of light. But it's convenient for the JNF to call itself an environmental organization. So I went on this study tour. I'll say more about that. Um, I, I then became... A, a, went on a Friends of the Earth International study uh, of, um, of Palestine. I'll say a little bit about singing, because also I, I, I was part of a solidarity choir that went and sang in, in Palestine. Went to Gaza uh, in 2014-15. I'll say a little bit about uh, Gazit and Hula, which are JNF sites. Um, I'll say a bit about the Popular Struggle Conference in 2019 that we went to. And then from 2020, I became chair of the Scottish Palestine Solidarity Campaign. So that's my personal involvement that gives me uh, an interest in this. Okay, so the Jewish National Fund, as I say, claims to be an environmental organization. Um, and if you went to its website, you'd think that that's what it was. Um, it was set up in 1901 by the, the World Zionist Organization as part of a suite of uh, Zionist institutions, the purpose of which is the colonization of Palestine for the purposes of, of, of creating an exclusively Jewish uh, state or an exclusively Jewish national home. <clears throat> you can see from the kind of imagery that, that the, the, these are posters from history, for, um, the, you can see from the imagery of the very kind of muscular, um, uh, uh, Way it's portrayed itself. It was it was set up as a colonizing uh, agency uh, in the days when it was it wasn't embarrassing to call yourself a colonizing agency. Um, but that's that's what it existed to do was to buy land or to obtain land in Palestine um, 
on behalf of the Jewish people. It was, it was, it was a custodian, it regarded itself as a custodian of land in Palestine for the Jewish people. <clears throat> That's important because the JNF never technically, according to its own constitution, owned land as, an, as, a, as a landowner. It was always owning land as a custodian for the Jewish people. The Jewish people, of course, live everywhere in the world. They all live in all parts of the world. So they're a custodian for Jews from all over the world to come to Palestine and settle on that land. So individual Jews wouldn't be able to own it either. But it, but it can only be owned by Jews. It can only be settled by Jews, lived on by Jews, worked on by Jews in perpetuity. So if the JNF ever sells land, it can only sell land to Jews. If the JNF buys land that is lived on by people who are not Jews, which in most cases would be Palestinians, then the Palestinians have to be removed in order for the Jews to, 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 to live and work on there. Um, so it was very much an agent of ethnic cleansing, an agent of um, expulsion of, uh, of, of the Palestinian population and settling uh, Jewish populations. Uh, onto. And if you can see, youth settlement in Palestine, the, the language is redeeming hand of the Jewish homeland. You, you can see the language that's been, been used uh, down, down the ages. Um, uh, and, you know, if you, if you think about an environmental organization that advertised itself as, as you know, with, with bulldozers and, and uh, dynamite and, and uh, th things like that, it, it, it doesn't look particularly environmental. But one of the things that it did <coughs> was it planted trees. So when it, when the organization, and it, when it was set up in 1901, it had very little money, it gradually got a little bit of money, bought a little bit of land, usually from absentee landowners, bit by bit managed to get a little bit more land. Um, and when it got land, it would often plant trees, and plant trees as, as barriers between the Jewish kibbutz and the Palestinians who were moved off the land. Um, and so planting trees became part of what it did. And then in 1948, um, when the Zionist militias had driven a lot of Palestinians off the land, the Nakba, um, the, 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 the Zionist militias, the Haganah, and, and the, the, what became the, the, the Israeli army, um, uh, needed to keep the Palestinians off the land that they'd been driven on. So they would plant trees, they would hand the land over to the Jewish National who would plant trees on. So trees were then planted on land as a means of preventing Palestinian return. Um, so planting trees has been a kind of feature of, of the JNF's activities increasingly over its, over its time. There's other things. They tried commercial forestry at one time. It wasn't very successful. They had, uh, various times they had increasing immigration into Palestine from from Jews from different parts of the world, so they needed they needed to create jobs for them. So forestry was was one of the things that they did. So there were various ways, but, but the tree planting became a bit of a theme, and they found that it was quite useful as a tree planting organisation to portray yourself to the rest of the world as an environmental organisation, and it was very useful because it, it, it has always had two functions. One is to obtain land in Palestine. Jewish settlement. The other is Zionist propaganda. And so it used the tree planting idea as a, as a very useful way of, of promoting Zionist propaganda. So um, <coughs> JNF, it was well, originally formed in Britain. After 1948, it moved its headquarters to Israel, and but it still created all the offices all throughout the world, which used a, which were used as a kind of propaganda tools to to promote tree planting, primarily amongst the Jewish populations of different countries, as a means of regarding Israel as being the kind of center for Judaism. So, raise money, bar, bar mitzvahs, people would, would, would donate money for, for trees in, in Israel. 
you know, making the desert, desert bloom, etc. That money would go to the JNF, JNF would plant. So it was the land obtaining and development agency, just as the, the Jewish agency was the political agency, the Haganah was the labor ag agency, that it was part of the Zionist collection of institutions. Alex, you were wanting to say something. A lot of the, the terms I, I don't know, so can you tell me what Zionist means? Okay, um, Zionist, the Zionist movement was um, in the 19th century, um, Theodor Herzog was kind of invented it. Um, well, he didn't invent it, it was invented by Christians, but, but the Jews took it over. Um, in the 19th century, there was a growth of nationalisms throughout Europe. Romantic nationalisms recovering their kind of, their, their, their kind of folk songs and, and, and native uh, uh, traditions and all the rest of it. And political nationalisms, saying that, you know, every ethnic group has to have its own nation state and all the rest of it. And those nationalisms emerged in different, in different ways and into the 20th century. And, and one of the ways that those nationalisms emerged was into, you know, things like Nazism and fascism, which, which actually said, um, you know, you have to have ethnically pure nations. And other ways that nationalism emerged was, was, was into... Um, Kind of romantic uh, composers, Smetana and Vojak and so on, re recovering their, their, their past um, their, or their, their, their indigenous traditions. Within that, there was also a debate about the Jewish question, as Marx would have called, Marx called it in his pamphlet. What was the Jewish question? How do we resolve the issue about the fact that Jews in lots of European countries did not have uh, were discriminated against, were disenfranchised, and all the rest of it. Um, and one of the uh, within Jewish thought, there were diverse views. Most Jews believed that the best thing was to integrate into the European uh, countries that they were part of to try and challenge the anti-Semitism that was there to, to to overturn the laws that were preventing them to get access to to jobs and all the rest of it. Um, Marx was arguing for the separation of, you know, essentially for the, for the, for the um, abolition of religion as a means of, um, uh, simplifying Marx, but, but it was, it, the, as Jews became more proletarianized and as Gentiles became more proletarianized, the, the religious division would, would be less. Within that faction, there was also those who argued the solution to the Jewish question is to take all the Jews out of Europe and out of Russia and out of all the other parts of the world where they exist and put them in a, give them their own state so that they have their own ethnic group, which is, which has its own state, self-determination for the Jews. And so that was the, that was the, it was a Jewish nationalist movement. And initially it could have been anyway, they looked at East Africa, they looked at the Eastern part of Russia but the religious Jews had a connection with Jerusalem, with Zion. Um, and so by marrying the kind of political nationalism with the religious Judaism, they created this idea that Palestine, where, where Jerusalem is, was the place where the Jews should create their, their state and create an ethnically pure um, as it is becoming as an ethnically pure or an ethnically privileged uh, state. The, there has been diversities within Zionism. Martin Buber was a, a Zionist and he, he argued that Jews should live alongside all the, you know, within a multicultural Palestine and all the rest of it. As, as, particularly from 1948, since the State of Israel was created, it had, the, the dominant form of Zionism, essentially the only form of Zionism, is to say that Israel is the place where the Jews have their are, are, are ethnically privileged. And for some Zionists, they would say that means you have to actually exclude all non-Jews from Palestine. For others, that they say non-Jews can be there, but they don't have the same rights as Jews because they're ethnically privileged. But basically, that idea that, that 
that there is a state for self-determination for Jews from all over the world to, to be. That, Thank you. I, I, yeah, I mean, I, I mean, and I think that there's, there's a kind of history of, because mm. Jews have lived in minorities in lots of European countries, mm. in Russia and lots of other places, mm. and have been discriminated against, as, as have many yeah, other. Yeah. One of the things that Jews have, I mean, so for example, Jews were historically prevented from um, uh, from, from from employment in public service, so they couldn't be employed by the state and all the rest of it. So they tended to go into business. Yeah, it did. It did. Yeah. It did. Yeah. yeah, although it wasn't a legal not, extra, yeah. Extra, yeah. Yeah. But but Jews, it was legal. They were legally prevented. So um, and and so therefore the businesses tended to support. The same with Quakers. Quakers, you know, a minority Christian sect were not allowed to, to, to serve in public service. So they went into business and they supported each other's businesses. And they, and they became known as good business people because, they, yeah. because of that. Yeah. So, so there are historical antecedents for, for how that happened. How can that happen? for, for the JNF, it was, it was more a kind of, you know, there, there's a, they were drawing on the Jewish religious tradition from Deuteronomy that, that, that said the land belongs to, to the, the promised people. Chosen people, um, and so the land essentially would belong to Yahweh, would belong to God. Uh, so for the settling of, of the Jewish people, so it was combining these religious ideas with the political nationalism, um, and so therefore they could say, which you know, it, very clever in a way to say, you know, to link these kind of religious and political ideas to say, well, when the JNF obtains land, they're holding it. Uh, as a custodian for the Jewish people, as in the Jewish people everywhere. So therefore, they encourage Jews from all over the world to come and settle on it. And then, you know, in, in the early stages, from the late 19th century, the Jews who were settling in Palestine were were committed Zionists. They they, they believed that they were that they were setting up a new society. And they might have been creating a new state, or they might have been just creating little communities, kibbutzim, or whatever. And then, because of uh, you know, anti-Semitic persecution in the 20th century, there were some uh, increasing numbers of Jews who weren't committed Zionists, but there was, it was a safe place for them to escape to. Um, and and you know, so there have been waves of, of different Jewish migration for different reasons. But, but the, the leadership has been given by the, by the Zionist movement through the Jewish agency, through the... Um, Jewish agency providing the kind of political, essentially the government waiting prior, prior to the state of Israel. The JNF providing the land and uh, means of, of expelling the, the Palestinian population. The Haganah for um, uh, providing labor and, and providing the protection of labor for, for labor, which now portrays itself as a trade union, or trade union center. Um, but it's, it was originally designed for a Zionist for Jewish labor. Uh, so these were the institutions that were being set up towards the end of the 19th, early 20th century for the purposes of the colonization of, of Palestine and the creation of a uh, Jewish homeland in Palestine. It's, I, th I think it's more about Zionism has, has always been a, a, a kind of alliance of religious Jews and, um, and political, you know, well, political nationalists. Not, the political nationalists needed the support of the religious. Back then, so, so the religious, well, both secular and religious Jews had diverse views. And so there was an attempt to uh, build alliances with the, I mean, Zionism originated in Christian fundamentalism, the idea that the Jews had to return to the, the you know, promised land before the, the second coming of Christ. And so they picked up some of those ideas, but some of the religious Jews, or the religious Ideas, I suppose, rather than necessarily, uh, is the, 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 they were appealing to some of the religious Jews. Ben Gurion was reputed to have said he didn't believe in God, but he gave them the land. So there was a degree of, of, of a rhetoric that was about religion, but most of the, of the Zionist leadership were not were not religious. Yet. Right. I don't know enough about Jewish theology, but I do know about the JNF. Which did use Deuteronomic, Deuteronomic ideas in its constitution, which as a means of, of, of saying, well, the 
land is held in, in, in trust for, for the Jewish people. Um, and, and then became an, an environmental organization. Um, so just so here's some photographs from the, uh, the JDF study tour. Um, uh, this is the remains of the village of Ajar, the Palestinian village of Ajar, which, which was depopulated by, uh, by the Haganah um, and uh, handed over to the JNF and turned it into a park. You can see a few trees, there's other trees elsewhere. There's, there's picnic tables at, um, in some parts of this park. And it's, so it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's an open park. You can go and have a picnic. Picnic tables say, this is supported by, by the JNF in Britain. Okay, so that's why it's called British Park. Uh, so JNF in Britain will have raised funds, primarily from the Jewish community, who think that they're planting trees and, and, and the rest of it. Um, and actually what they're doing is covering up the remains of the Palestinian village uh, of Ajar in, in, in this case. Um, it didn't just happen in 1948. So in 1967, when, uh, when Israel um, occupied West Bank and the, and the Gaza Strip, and annexed some areas of, of um, along the Green Line. <clears throat> uh, they created Canada Park. Um, this is the remains of the village of Imwas, um, which the, the reckon is possibly the same site of, as the, the village of Emmaus that is referred to in the Bible. Um, uh, but it's Canada Park from 1967, raised money from uh, JNF in Canada, in order to create the roads and the picnic tables and the, the places to lock your, your mountain bike and so on. But if you look in amongst the trees, you can see uh, um, buildings that were demolished. And, and one of the guy that took us around this said that you can tell you can tell in this particular case, the previous one, you can, you can it, it was just knocked down, bulldozed, and, and you can see the, the remains. Of, that was that was blown up. That must have been a, um, an explosion inside because the, the roof has just collapsed yeah, in, in that way. So uh, um, it was. And when we were there in 2010, the same thing was happening uh, in the Negev um, or Al Arakib, the Bedouin village, which was uh, when we were there that it had been demolished, I think six times, um, and the people keep coming back, building more tents, and continue to live there. I think the last I heard, it, it had been demolished something like 160 times, possibly more than that by now. They keep coming back, keep being demolished. And this is land owned by the JNF with a view to, they want to get rid of the Palestinian population in order to plant trees, and then in the trees, create settlements for, for Jewish occupancy. So this is the environmental organization. Just uh, because the JNF, um, as I say, it has offices in, in lots of different countries throughout the world for the purpose of propaganda and raising funds for things in Israel, there is an organization called JNF KKL Scotland. KKL is, is the abbreviation from the, the, the anglicized version of the Hebrew version of JNF. So they call it JNF KKL Scotland. Uh, and it's, it's a charity. It's registered as a, an environmental charity in Scotland. Uh, it, meet, it has charitable deeds for environmental improvement in Israel. Um, and through freedom of information requests, we, uh, we got some correspondence between the Office of the Scottish Charities Regulator and JNF KKL Scotland, where we discovered that um, there we are, there's seven, 70 thousand pounds that they had raised in money um, as remitted to KKL in Israel for the construction of the Gazette Reservoir situated in the north of the country. So that's the picture that, that, that we've got through the Freedom of Information uh, request that, that the JNF Scotland had provided to the Office of the Scottish Charities Regulators. Um, so that was what they were raising funding, funding for, an environmental improvement in Israel. So in 2017, I went to visit Gazit 
uh, in, in the Galilee, uh, Kibbutz Gazit. Um, it's it's, it's uh, in an area of, of um, popular with, with hill walkers and, and, uh, and mountain bikers and so on. Um, and um, after a, quite a long time, we managed to find the reservoir. Uh, and it, it was surrounded by fencing with that sign on it. I don't know if anyone speaks Arabic. Yeah, I, I, I had some, when I did this before, somebody could read Hebrew, it's so, so, so a similar, similar kind of thing, so it's brackish water or something, or something like, brackish water or, or not, unclean water or something oh, like, yeah, yeah. yeah. Basically, it's, it, it is a reservoir in the sense of it, is, it contains water for the purposes of irrigating uh, the intensive agriculture of the kibbutz. Which is being produced for for um, cash cropping. So, not exactly an environmental improvement. It's just creating a reservoir for the purposes of irrigation. Um, did manage to just about see a little bit of water there by climbing up the fence. Um, certainly not uh, the kind of environmental improvement that, that uh, local people can benefit from. Um, and, and also, incidentally, the <coughs> Kibbutz Gazit um, was about three kilometers from a Palestinian village within the state of Israel, uh, and the Palestinian village had no access to the, to the reservoir, had no access to the, to the water in the reservoir. It's purely for the Kibbutz. Um, so, a very good illustration, if you like, of water apartheid. Um, and we wandered around the land and we found some some rubble. I have no idea whether this is the rubble from the village. There was a village here called Altira, um, which was forcibly, um, uh, the population was forcibly removed by the Haganah in 1948 um, on the uh, instruction of Yusuf Feitz. Yusuf Feitz was the leader of, of land development within the JNF. So the, the, the lead senior people within the JNF, very close to Ben Gurion, had the power to instruct the Haganah to um, ethnically cleanse particular areas and then for the JNF to take that land. So essentially the JNF was being used as a, as a kind of military, uh, as an adjunct to the military to drive the population out, take control of the land and then hand it over to the Jewish population for, for uh, agriculture. So two, two terms, uh, if you just clarify, you, 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 uh, you, you spoke about kibbutz mm -hmm. and Haganah. Mm -hmm. uh, so can you tell yep. me what those are? Okay, the Haganah was the, um, the, the Zionist militia during the mandate period. And it was trained by the British and it was primarily used to, to um, suppress the Palestinian population that was resisting the increasing encroachment of, of Jewish settlers. So, it, and, and then it became increasingly like an army, and it was, it was the Haganah which led the conversion to the Israeli army, which, which, which was involved in the wars against, um, against the Arabic uh, armies in 1948. 47 to 49, I think. So the Haganah was that. The, there were smaller Zionist militia, the Stern Gang and, and, and others, that were absorbed into the, into the people. But the Haganah was, the, was the, the biggest and was essentially friendly to the British colonial state, colonial state trained the, the Haganah. Uh, kibbutz is a kind of cooperative farm that was the, a lot of the early um, uh, Zionist settlers had utopian ideals about cooperative agriculture. So once, once you get the Palestinians off the land, then you can create your own utopia, you know, so they were doing it through, through uh, cooperative farms. And in fact, you know, um, in the 1960s and 70s, a lot of British socialists went over to Israel because it was, it was creating socialism by by cooperative farming and pesticides and they make all kinds of things now. Yeah. They're still kibbutz to they encourage tourism. It was, when I was a student, there were still people going. That was in the 1980s. 
Does that, has anyone heard of any? I mean, they're, they're still there. I mean, yeah. they're, they're a bit like gated communities in a, in a way now. But, and, 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 you know, they are agricultural, some of them. I mean, they're, they're, as you say, some of them are manufacturing, but they still have the, an intensive uh, agricultural sector as well. So Where did that what? We wrote a report to the Charities Commission, to, to the, well, Oscar, Oscar in Scotland, yeah. um, uh, provided all the links and saying, you know, and they said they did an investigation, said, and then eventually they came back and said, uh, we've done an investigation and we think that they're meeting their charitable objectives. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. So, uh, at some point, another freedom of information <laughs> request will come in about, about what they actually did. Yeah. Um, because usually what the, what the Charities Commission is worse than Oscar, but Oscar is, is, is not exactly you know, radical. What I think they will do is, is look at what the objectives are and if the objectives of the charity are charitable, Oscar say, well, that's, that's our responsibility to deal with. Mm -hmm. If the trustees of the charity are not sticking to the objectives, then it's the charity should get rid of their trustees. It's not Oscar's business. That's, that's what I suspect that they've done. They've, they've avoided conflict. Yeah. I mean, Politics of charities is a whole big yeah, thing, you know. Yeah, yeah. They I, I, won't I avoid charity, they won't yeah. avoid conflict if it's, a, if it's an Islamic yeah. charity, but, but mm -hmm. they will if it's... So, I, think it, I think it's also, it's, it's a kind of ideology, it's, it's the political Zionism, it's not religious, it's not about, it's yeah. about ethnic, ethnic uh, supremacy. So, Modi has an ethnic supremacy yeah. for the Hindus, yeah. Orderbach has an ethnic supremacy for the, for the Hungarians, you know. So, they, they can speak the same language. It doesn't matter that Orban is an anti-Semite. You know, they'll still be happy to cozy up to him because they have this idea of, of you know, as people say, it means the Jews go to, to, to Israel rather. But, but it's, a, it's a common ideology. So the, the politics is, is similar. Isn't it? Mm. Yeah. Absolutely. But within Israel, the, the, the Sephardic Jews who, who get you know, discriminated against compared with Ashkenazi Jews, they don't sign with Palestinians. They, they, they're still, the, the ideology of Zionism still manages to hold them within. And all was happy. But they can blame the Muslims because... Well, they, yeah. And the Sephardic Jews can blame the Palestinians. But I think, I, I mean, uh, British colonialism and French colonialism is part of it. Zionist presence is part of it as well. But there's also, in, you know, within these Arab countries, there are real instabilities. As, you know, yeah. Lebanon is, 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 a, is a mess. <laughs> Egypt, the repression of, of, of dictators within Arabic states is, is part of it as well. So all these things combine together. And also, Israel is not actually all that stable, is it? You know, it, it, it's stable because it's it armed, stable. armed it to the hill stable. by the yeah. United States. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's not, they like, Israel likes to portray itself as the only stable democracy in the region. And it looks like that when you, you have kind of a mess in Lebanon, you have a mess in, in, in Egypt and all the rest of it. But actually, it's, it's not quite as clear cut as that anyway. It's much more more complex than that. Yeah, and, and you know, they retain their stability by keeping an iron fist on the Palestinians. Okay, um, I'll say a little bit about the, work, the, the stuff I did with Friends of the Earth. Um, I I used to work for Friends of the Earth, as I said, Friends of Scotland, I used to work for Friends of the and um, had an involvement with Friends of the Earth, and because of my involvement in Stop the JNF, um, I was asked to take part in a, uh, an observer mission to Palestine. Um, and that was in 2012. Um, and the observer mission essentially was myself from Friends of the Earth Scotland and a guy called Bobby Peake from Friends of the Earth South Africa um, met with. Uh, the, what was just starting to form as Friends of the Earth Palestine, it was the Palestine Environmental NGO Network, um, Pengon, 
which was affiliating with Friends of the Earth International. And there were several purposes of our, our visit, it was to look at how the Israeli occupation was contributing to environmental injustices, which is what we did and we were shown now, but also to uh, demonstrate the role that Friends of the Earth Palestine can play in, in not only improving the environment, but doing so by challenging the Israeli occupation. And part of the reason for that was because Friends of the Earth International had another affiliate group, which was called um, EcoPeace. And it was Friends of the Earth Middle East, we called itself. And it was an alliance, or is an alliance, of Palestinian, Jordanian, and Israelis. So their method of, of improving the environment was get Israelis, Palestinians, and Jordanians to cooperate with one another, cooperate with the infrastructure, the Israeli occupation, and then you can improve the environment. So they did a lot of work about the Jordan, the Jordan River. Okay, so Jordan River, as soon as the State of Israel was formed, one of the first things that they did was to create the, the, the National Water Carrier, which, which took water from the, uh, from the uh, Galilee's, Sea of Galilee through to the dry parts of what became the State of Israel uh, in order to irrigate and particularly down to the Nakab Desert to make the desert bloom. So all the, so the water was redirected from, from the Galilee through the National Water Carrier, which depleted the water going into the, the Jordan so um, by the 1970s, 80s, uh, the water flow through the River Jordan was 4% of what it had been under the mandate, 4% it depleted by that amount. So it was an ecological disaster. So what EcoPeace was doing was saying, okay, let's get, get uh, Israelis, Palestinians, and Jordanians to work together, and we'll work with the occupying uh, forces to try and release some of the water back into the Jordan, Villa, Jordan Bar, um, River and, and, and rehabilitate the, 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 the river. And what Pengong was saying is, don't do that because what you're doing is normalizing the Israeli occupation. Just, just treating it as if it's, you know, we live with it, it's going to be there forever and the environment is better, is more important than that. What you need to do is to demonstrate that actually the occupation is causing the environmental problem. You don't just um, collude with it in order to make minor improvements. So there was this battle going on within Friends of the Earth International between Pengon and EcoPeace, which, which was the better way to represent environmental improvements in the region. Is it through cooperation with the colonialists or is it through rejecting the colonialists and, and linking environmental colonization with environmental destruction. So that, and I did my little part of the, in the um, observer mission, and I co-wrote a report, which we called the Environmental Nakba. So the Nakba, the catastrophe for, usually referred to in 1948 when the Palestinians were, 80% uh, of the Palestinians were evicted from their, their villages. Um, but the Nakba, the ethnic cleansing, the catastrophe, is ongoing. And one of the mechanisms that, they use, that is used by Israel in order to ethnically cleanse the Palestinians is environmental um, change, environmental uh, injustice. And so we looked at land grabbing is, is, is the most obvious one, but also water, water grabbing. So the, the, uh, providing water to the settlements within the West Bank and, and preventing the Palestinian communities accessing water. We looked at waste dumps uh, where um, land was being used by, um, by Israelis to dump uh, un, un, um, uh, unregistered dump sites. So the waste was being put in there, but nobody knew what was being put in there. It was accumulating, accumulating. You know, there's a small number of, of um, Palestinians who say, yeah, you use my land, you know, why don't you give me some money and that'll be it. So, uh, so toxins were going into the, into the land. Sewage, 
sewage from settlements were being put out into Palestinian agricultural land, so the agricultural land becomes unusable, becomes toxic. When the agricultural land is, is unusable, a lot of Palestinians move off, try and find jobs elsewhere. That's the ethnic cleansing that, you, that they want to, to, you want to do with it. Um, the uh, um, industrial sites in uh, industrial settlements uh, beside Tokara, Tokara, and this is uh, interesting, in the green, in the in the seam zone, there's a um, an industrial site. Seam zone is 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 the is the area between the the armistice line, the green line, uh, which is just the de facto border between Palestine and Israel, between the occupied West Bank and Israel, the de facto border. And then Israel's built a wall, as we know, and the most of the wall is in the Palestinian side. So there's a gap between the wall and the de facto border, the green line. In, so that bit of land essentially is part of the West Bank. In theory, should be governed by the Palestinian Authority, but in practice, nobody can access it without a military permit because you have to get through the wall. So what do you do in that bit of green, uh, that bit of seam zone? Well, in Tukaram, what they did is they built an industrial estate for chemical factories from Israel that were not very popular in Israel because they were producing a lot of pollution and, and gas and all the rest of it. So they moved them into the, into the seam zone. Um, and uh, so the, <coughs> the, the, the workers in the seam zone have to have military permits to get to work. Anyone starts complaining or about the, the pollution or anyone starts to, to talk about trade unions, they lose their military permit, they can't get a job. Um, anyone complains about the, the pollution happening or health and safety, they can't get access to it. So it's, it's, it was a, a Palestinian Authority can't inspect it. There's no Israeli in, uh, pollution inspector can't, can't or maybe could, but not interested in, in um, inspecting it because it's technically part of the West Bank. So it's an ideal site for polluting factories to locate themselves. <clears throat> so we, we visited, we visited. Another aspect of that, of the wall, is that if you if you trace where the wall is, is uh, has been built or is being built, and then you also trace the, um, uh, the sites of economically viable um, extraction of water from the aquifer. It follows the same line. So basically, the building the wall to prevent access to water. Um, uh, to, you can't build a well. A well. You, you can you can only build a well on the wrong side of the of, of the wall. So that's another mechanism whereby through water apartheid, they are driving people off the land. So environmental management, if you like is being used as a form of ethnic cleansing. I, I haven't got the slide, but there, there's some, some interesting slides which shows that the, the average access to water for Palestinians and Israeli settlers in the West Bank. And Israeli settlers have more access to water than Israelis in Israel, even though they're, they're, you know, that water is just pumped into the... Whereas the Palestinians in the West Bank have less than... World, the World Health Organization's minimum requirement for daily access to water. Now that that will vary. You know, Jordan Valley will be particularly bad, very bad, and, and, and in Ramallah there's a bit more access. But 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 nonetheless, it's yeah, passing access to water. What I do have, let me just jump. Yeah, the um, in the Gaza Strip, access to water is even more. Problematic. So um, this is uh, basically the red areas are where water levels in the aquifer are particularly low, and the green areas are where, where it's better. So um, because of over over pumping, because the, the aquifer within Gaza is, is is goes all the way along the coast. So. Part of it is in the state of Israel, part of it's in Gaza. And so Israel is, is over pumping the, um, the, the 
water. So the aquifer level is getting more and more depleted. There's also a wadi, a, a river, that, the Wadi Gaza, which flows from what is now in the state of Israel through Gaza to, to the sea, but it's been dammed on the Israeli side. So there's no, uh, the water is not being, um, not coming through. So access to fresh water in Gaza is, is desperately, desperately low. So for, for, for many Gazans, the only way they can access fresh water is, is buying it from Israel. So Israel sells water. So now obviously Gazans who have a bit of money can afford to do that. Most Gazans can. So if you, and then if you look at, um, these are water level decline in the northern and southern area of Gaza. And you can see the direction of, of travel in, in, in which the, the, the levels of access to fresh water uh, are, are getting, getting worse and worse. Um, and uh, I was in Gaza in December 2014 into, into January 2015. Um, now you, you you remember that 20, August July August 2014 there was a Israeli attack Operation Cast Lead the uh, Israeli attack on Gaza very vicious bombing and attacks on, on, on Gaza so a lot of the the um, uh, yeah the, the results of that attack were, were visible when when I was there and that's that's a water tower so one of the things that farmers do. Uh, because the, the, the access to the, the aquifer is, is very poor, it's brackish, it's salty water, it leak, leaks from the Mediterranean into the aquifer, so it's unusable. So if, there, if, there's a, if there's a lot of rain, they capture as much as they can of the fresh water into the water tower so that they can irrigate their crops. And they have these big water towers up on, up on, um, on, on lakes. So you can see for miles around that these are water towers. Yeah. Very clearly, civilian infrastructure being used for agriculture. That's what gets bombed by the Israelis. Yeah. Clearly not a military target, but destroyed in order to try and destroy the agriculture. That's, the, um, that's a sewage management site. So essentially, Israel... In Gaza. In Gaza, yeah. So... Um, Israel prevents uh, equipment getting into Gaza uh, that can be used to, to, for, for sewage um, management because Israel says, well, they can also use it for making weapons. So basically they use a settle, a settle uh, the sewage is allowed to settle in a big, big pit like that, basically. And that's the way of managing it. When they have a heavy rainfall, all gets mixed up, and this sewage in, in the streets, in the, in, in, the, uh, in the local area, and, and of course it's being pushed out into the Mediterranean, which is effect, which is damaging what is left of the fishing industry, given that given that the fishermen can't actually get more than um, well, it varies, but, but very few uh, miles out out of the sea because it's being controlled by the Israeli blockade. So, um, so water, in terms of water, water is being used as a as a mechanism of environmental macro um, in the West Bank and in Gaza, yeah. and and within the lands of uh, colonizing forty eight, the uh, state of Israel in in the Nakab, where water is being directed to the Israeli settlements, and the Bedouin are being. Uh, deprived of access to water because they're not recognized villages within Israel. Let, let me just finish with this um, story uh, about environment and, and, and Palestine. This is a photograph taken from within Gaza, looking north, um, and it's, it's a power station. Um, and actually, you can. It's, the, the visible parts are the, the are coal fired power station, and that's for the, that's the coal. But there's just about to see there's some, some, uh, some bits of industry over there which are um, a gas fired power station. And that's 
that's what the gas fired power station looks like. I got that photograph from uh, uh, the website of the Wood Group. Uh, the Wood Group is a is a uh, an oil infrastructure um, company based in Aberdeen, um, uh, and they they build pipelines and they build power stations and all the rest of it. And so they built this gas fired power station for Israel uh, to supply. Israeli resettlements and to use the gas that Israel is claiming from the Mediterranean Sea that is within lands that within sea that should belong to the Palestinians. So using Palestinian gas to uh, to generate electricity for Israel um, uh, run by a Scottish company. So what we did right this is this is the map this is the the Gaza Strip at the bottom, you can see where the, um, uh, the border is just about there, or where the, the blockade is. The Dorad power station, you can see the ring around it, and all these other names are Palestinian villages that were depopulated um, in the Nakba, and most of them, the land handed over to the JNF. So, and most of the people who previously lived in these villages are now refugees living in Gaza or the descendants of refugees living in Gaza. So we, we managed to interview, um, not us ourselves, but we arranged for, for um, local activists in Gaza to interview refugees living in Gaza who could remember growing up in these villages that had been taken over by the JNF and which most recently had been taken over by the Wood Group, the Scottish company, that, to build a power station for supplying um, uh, Israel. Mm. Yeah, yeah, they were forced out in, forced. in, in, in the net Nagra. For, for a while, some of the people who had been forced out were, were going back into Israel to work, but they couldn't move back. They, 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 they weren't allowed to move out, but they were there for, as laborers. So they could see the land that used to be theirs, and and now they can't see it at all because of the blockade. They can, but they can see the power stations. And and actually, it's like, quite interesting. Some of the interviews with the, with the refugees say, well, when when they were growing up, the Jews weren't the enemy. They were they were Jewish people that they would trade with and all the rest of it. So could not all of the Jews that were settled were Zionists. Some of them were refugees themselves. Um, uh, and so they say, you know, we, we don't hate Jewish people. It, it's it's, no, it's, it's the Israelis not. that are that are, mm -hmm. and, and we see that now with the you know the very hard right yeah. Zionists yeah. in the government, yeah, yeah like um, Ben Gavir, um, quite openly saying what what the Israeli government has been doing for a long time, but saying it quite openly. We want to drive the Palestinians out. We want the whole of, of this land. Don't know. I, I, I can imagine it possibly is in Israel. Um, you, know, you can ask who owned, who owned the land before it was Israel. No, I, wonder if, yeah, if you'd come I haven't. I haven't come across these big, big, big solar farms. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's it's it, it's a bit like the tree planting. You know, you, it's not that planting trees is a bad thing in itself. It's just that you know it's being used. To drive people off their land, and, yeah. and it's a form of land grab. Yeah, mm -hmm. um, and it's also interesting. The European Union has funded quite a few solar energy projects in in the West Bank, um, and, and the uh, the military then destroy them. So yeah. Israel is controlling everything. But if the if the European Union is funding it, it makes it, it makes it a little bit easier for them. To, I mean, I don't know if that's still happening now, but it was happening. Uh, until fairly recently, where Israel, because it's a, it's a, but international aid is is tied to things that are apolitical. So if if it, European Union says, look, we're building solar panels, yeah, nobody's against solar panels. It provides electricity to remote communities. So the Palestinians put it in the remote communities. Remote communities are an area C, so it's governed by the military, and the military will say this is a military zone you're not allowed to build anything and they destroy it. So things that are built by, with funding from the European Union or from other sources, get destroyed by the Israeli military because 
they say that they're not allowed to, to go. And particularly, you know about the Masafriata the, in the South Hebron Hills, where it, the whole area has been uh, has been declared a, a firing zone by the military. So they're trying to evict all the people. And the pe people who live there are refusing to uh, to leave. Um, many of them live in caves. They, when they try and build, hou build houses or build mosques or build buildings, they get destroyed. When, when I visited uh, um, Al-Mafakara in, in, uh, in Mosafiyata, Yata, um, it was the activists were helping the local communities to build buildings. And they would build, they would construct a tent, which the Israeli military won't, won't attack. But then they build a building within the tent, so the military can't see it. Sooner or later, they actually find out and they just destroy it. So they had destroyed a, a mosque when I was there. So, yeah, Masafi Yata was under a particular attack at the moment. Yeah. One, of, one of the things in our, in our report on Friends of the Earth uh, was, was about the declaration of national parks. Yeah. That's another, another yeah. tool that's been used. Yeah. Yeah. Declare this a national park yeah. and we have to cut down all the olive trees and just let the wildlife grow and keep the Palestinians out so that the Israeli settlers can come and have picnics there. Yeah, it, yeah. another environmental inverted commas tool. What well, well, I will give out some leaflets about the um, the plant of tree in Palestine. Yeah. Uh, so because the JNF uses tree planting as a political tool for Zionism, the Stop the JNF campaign, which is an alliance of groups has launched Plant a Tree in Palestine as a yes, kind of yes. mirror of that, yeah. where we raise funds and we and provide the, the, the resources for Palestinian um, farmers to buy uh, mostly grape trees, some olive trees and so on, to, to, to stay on the land. And we know that the settlers come and they tear them up and they destroy them, and so the farmers just part, plant more. And so planting trees is an act of resistance to colonization. When we, when we do it. When the JNF do it, it is a tool of colonization. So yeah. we're using that as a means not only to, to support the, the farmers, but also to um, uh, tell the story here about, you know, if you're, if you're helping to plant trees, it's good for the environment, but it's also resisting the colonization of Palestine and supporting the you know, people you know, we talk about Sumut, the, the, the yeah, resistance by just remaining yeah. on the land. Do you know Almasara, the village of Almasara in Almasara, in the Bethlehem area? You know, it's a village I go to quite a lot. Where the chap who lives there, um, Mahmoud Zwahri, who has been very much leading the, the popular resistance, popular struggle coordination committee. Let me, yeah, so this is Mahmoud over there. Um, and so there's been, you know, there's multiple, there always, there's, there's always been Palestinian resistance. And so I just really wanted to end the talk by talking about Palestinian resistance, reminding us that the Palestinians are resisting by planting trees and staying on the land, but also by confronting the settlers, confronting the, 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 the soldiers, refusing to, to, to budge. And this chap, Mahmoud, is, is, is a, a very inspirational uh, uh, chap who, who, who kind of regularly in the demonstrations goes and confronts the, the soldiers and confronts them with, the, with, with really their own denial of humanity. It says to them, do you not have parents? Do you not have brothers and sisters? Mm -hmm. Imagine if they, if, if they were here, you know, so confronting them with their own humanity. So the Popular Resistance Group Coordination Committee on the right there and Stop the Wall on the left, these are kind of uh, grassroots organizations that are maintaining a resistance. And I, I wanted to have, this is a photograph from the last time I was in Palestine you can just about see me there. Um, uh, we went to a conference on the popular struggle, and then at the end of the conference, we were invited to go and uh, invade one of these outposts. And we're talking about, you know, first of all, the settlers come, they build two or three houses, and then they, then it's stuff. So this was an outpost, and so we all we all went up. There were about 150 of us, most mostly Palestinians, but maybe about 50 internationals. Um, went and invaded the, the, the outpost, put Palestinian flags up and all the rest of it. 
Of course, we couldn't stay there that long because the Israeli army started coming in all those people. And so we spent the rest of the day hiding in olive groves and things to avoid the Israeli army. Some some people did get arrested. Some, um, well, part of the role of the internationals was to try and prevent the Palestinians being arrested. So if the Israeli army tried to arrest some, they would just pile on top and stop them being taken away. But some of the internationals got arrested and were deported. But we managed to, you know, it's not to be deported. Uh, yeah, well, it, they did plant non-indigenous. The, 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 the tree that they were most fond of, the JNF, was, was they call it the Jerusalem pine, the Aleppo pine to everyone else. But um, it's, it is indigenous to the region, but it's, it's in kind of mountain tops and scattered copses. They planted it as if it was a plantation tree, so they planted it in totally wrong places, and and, and lots of it, lots of them died. Um, it was very it was planted in unecological. They're also planting eucalyptus, which is not indigenous, and is completely the wrong thing to plant because it sucks up water like nothing. So, uh, so yeah, I mean the JNF has been terrible at planting the wrong kind of trees in the wrong kind of places, and then claiming to be environmental. The, um, and they put the eucalyptus in Paris. Yeah. And, and it, 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 it's, it um, stabilizes ground, but it takes a lot of a lot of a lot of water. But the thing is, there are people within the JNF, there are Zionists within the JNF who are saying we shouldn't be doing these things. From my point of view, it's, yes, it's bad that they're, that they're planting the wrong trees in the wrong place. But even if they were planting the right trees. Yeah. For the purposes of ethnic cleansing, it would be, it would be as well. so. Um, so yeah, you're absolutely right. Uh, but, but the main focus is, is why they're doing it rather than what they're planting. Donations when somebody dies, very family are encouraged to donate trees to to Israel or bar mitzvahs. And, and yes, it's, mm. it's, it's it's kind of it's been in, enculturated into a lot of Jewish communities. That that's just what they do. I've heard a lot of Jewish people say that. So that's popular resistance in Palestine. And the final thing that the rest of the world can do is boycott divestment and sanctions. You know, I think I think we were talking about that when we had our breaks. When we had our breaks. When we had our breaks. When we had our breaks.